I want to talk a little bit today about the power of understanding innovation as a social system. Many years ago, I came to the United States to do my PhD, and I came to a small town by the name of Evanston, Illinois. And as you may imagine, doing your PhD is a very uh, exciting but also very stressful time. So I was happy to discover that right next to where I was living, there was a beautiful little park. And so I thought, why don't I just go over to the park and feed the birds? That will relax me. And I went over one day and I took a bag of breadcrumbs. I sat down on the bench, spread out the crumbs, and I thought, okay, birds of Evanston, I'm ready. <laughs> um, unfortunately, nothing happened. So I went back home and I thought, okay, I need to, I need to bring back a breadcrumbs. I came back the next day, sat down on the bench, spread out my breadcrumbs. Birds of Evanston, what do you think? Are you coming? But they didn't come. So this happened uh, for about a month, and nothing happened. The birds wouldn't show up, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm from Germany, I was born and raised in Germany, and maybe, you know, U.S. birds are a little shyer, or, you know. So at any rate, I then decided, in my boredom and despair, why don't I just draw a map of the park? Here's the map of the park. It was called Wells Hill Park, and you see three benches, four tree clusters, and a playground. But there was actually much more going on. Parks are very exciting places for that, so you see, in addition to the birds, I didn't want to have anything to do with me, there were dog owners, there were children, and there were squirrels. And I thought to myself, isn't it amazing how, you know, your view on life really changes in the moment you kind of start looking left and right. You know, so I focused not so much anymore on the breadcrumbs and more on the environment, and I discovered, wait, you know, when we all co-shape each other's experience of this park, what would the implication of all these other people be on the likelihood of these birds adopting my breadcrumbs? For example, the squirrels often would come and eat the breadcrumbs, and I could see how this would shy the birds away. So I decided the next day, to come with a bag of nuts. And I placed the bag of nuts in the southeast corner of the park. And uh, you can probably guess what happened. Uh, the squirrels all gravitated towards the nuts, which was great. So that distraction was removed, and the squirrels were happier than ever before. But there was an unintended consequence. The dog owners were really upset, because all the dogs ran towards the nuts as well. So I decided, uh, let's bring some dog treats and put them into the northwest corner of the park. And uh, that made the dog owners very happy, and they all gravitated towards the dog treats. But um, there was still one group of stakeholders in this park that was, in some sense, kind of interfering with my project of bird feeding, and those were the kids. So the kids were at the place playing and having a good time. So what can possibly steer the kids away from the playground? Ice cream truck. <laughs> so I brought in an ice cream truck, and in that moment, all the kids uh, moved to the west end of the park. And then something interesting happened. All of a sudden, I realized the park had really fundamentally changed. Everyone was happier than ever before, we were all enjoying the park together, but the difference was that I was now able to actually go and feed the birds. So, that was an important learning experience for me in Evanston many, many years ago. And isn't it interesting how we always focus on the breadcrumbs and the birds and never on the park? It's especially interesting in the context of innovation because, you know, now that I study innovations, I often go to parties and people approach me and say, Marcus, I have this awesome innovation in my hand. Can you help me make it go viral? So here's the breadcrumb innovation that I brought. It's a little bottle of Botox Cosmetic. And the makers behind this innovation are obviously very convinced that this is the best breadcrumb in the world. 
you know, and I can see how this is happening because in the end, isn't Botox more effective than makeup and also less painful and less uh, invasive than plastic surgery? So that's the breadcrumb. But what happens if we actually look at the park? And that's what we did in a study on Botox Kismetic. So we studied Botox for over eight years to try to understand how does this innovation become successful in society. And what we found was actually pretty interesting. What the innovators think about Botox is uh, one thing, but most of us in society think very differently about Botox. You know, most of us think, does this stuff give me a frozen face? Does it have the potential to make me addicted? Is it even deadly? I mean, after all, isn't that poison? And so on and so forth. So what you see here is that there are many, many other actors in the park. They're unhappy. So what made Botox successful over time? Was it all about making the innovation go viral? Because it's so inherently better and more advanced than everything else out there. No. It was probably about creating a park where we can all age gracefully, but each in their different way. So can we create a park of aging gracefully that is larger than the sum of its parts? And that is what Allergan, the company behind Botox, had to do in order to make it succeed. So this is interesting. You know, in innovation, it seems that the breadcrumb matters less than the park. So we thought, can we take this to the next level? Because managers, you know, breadcrumbs, parks, they don't really uh, listen to that kind of stuff. Um, so we decided to study a different innovation, this time Uber. Now, I guess many of us know Uber. It's a great way to um, get through the city, ride-sharing and so on. But it turns out there are also other voices that don't like Uber so much. So the question is, how do these voices affect Uber's success? And what does Uber have to do in order to make its innovation successful? So we took the park and scaled it up, and we used big data and analytics to do this. Can be done because, you know, people talk in the park. And a great sort of data point that helps us illustrate these conversations are media articles. So why don't we just take all the media articles that exist about Uber? to get a better handle on the understanding people have about the park of mobility. So what you're looking at right now is um, this park. It is Uber's park. And the surprising thing is that there are many, many conversations, but um, not all of them are positive. So the green cluster here are all the conversations that exist about Uber that are positive. You know, it's a great way to enjoy some luxury, it's comfortable, it's flexible. So that's not surprising. But the red stuff, these are all the voices in the park that are not happy with the presence of Uber in this particular space. So when this is anything to go by, I think Uber still has a long way to go until it has created a park and a park experience that is greater than the sum of its parts for everyone. So I have a modest proposal to make today. As you are thinking about the next big thing as innovators, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and makers, try to understand your role a little differently. Don't just look at your breadcrumb and think about how you can make it go viral. Try to think about the space in which you operate in and try to create an environment and an experience that works for everyone. Innovations, to a large extent, are catalysts of economic progress. But you know what? I think they are even more successful when we look at them as catalysts of social transformation. So if we want to envision a better future, and I think this is why so many of us are here today, do it as I did, take a walk in the park. Thank you very much.